So if you are youth, you are more than welcome to join us Friday evenings. If you have a heart for the youth, you're also welcome to join us. Hoe kom net jylle sit? Ek gaan ook so'n bykie sit van ochend. <laughs> the, uh, um, the blessing about second service and having three services is that you can make all your mistakes in the first service and you can gradually improve. All right? So in the first service, I forgot to do communion and all sorts of things. So uh, praise God. Second service Im- improvement. Um, so welcome to all our visitors, the guys visiting us first time this morning. You're most welcome. Thank you for being here this morning and also... All of you guys streaming this morning, thank you for being with us. We pray that the Lord will bless you there where you are, and you'll feel at home as, um, as well. Just a, a very quick um, pre-announcement announcement that um, the first Thursday in April, we're going to start off with our men's breakfast again. Okay, so those of you guys that have missed out on that, remember that Thursdays last year, we had men's breakfast. Just a time where we come together, we have a lack of breakfast, and then we just chat through some issues opportunities and blessings of what it means to be guys and we encourage each other and we pray for each other. And so keep an eye out for that in the, in the announcements. Okay, so um, this morning I would like to start a conversation with us regarding just preparing our hearts. We sang the song this morning, we're getting ready um, for Jesus to, to come. And we know when we say that Jesus, or we ask Jesus to come, there are obviously different ways in which we can interpret that. Right? On the one hand, we will see in the New Testament, the disciples, they actually had this greeting with which they greeted each other quite often. And they would say, Maranatha, as they're greeting each other, and they would just mean, come, Lord Jesus, come. They come quickly. So it was actually something that reminded them that their home is with Jesus, is with Christ. Everything here on earth is temporal, and that we are actually yearning for Jesus to come back for us, to live in such a way that we are ready for his return. Uh, in our hearts, in our attitudes, in the way that we relate to others, in the way that we share the gospel with other people as well. We want Jesus to come back because we know this world is a broken place. We know this world is so much pain, so much chaos. We want Jesus to come back so that he can restore everything. But we also know that there are still so many who need to hear about the good news of Jesus. That's why, you know, please continue to pray for Yako and Skuman in India. Um, Daniela, she's leaving as well. Keep your eye out, open for announcements. It will be coming through about some other mission trips coming up. In, we're working with Shofar Stellenbosch. We will, um, in all likelihood, do a family mission trip to Prince Albert, which isn't too far. It's just in the Karoo. It's a beautiful place. We've got a Shofar church there. We would love to go and support them, work with the youth, uh, do some marriage uh, counseling, and just work with the people in Prince Albert. Then also, early in June, I'm taking a team to the Congo. So if you are passionate about Congo, you would like to go along, um, please come and chat to me. And there will be some, some other trips coming up as well. Okay. Um, so we believe that Jesus is worth serving and following and proclaiming to the nations. So if we say shout it to the nations, I know some of you guys have got a loud voice and so you can literally shout that all the nations can hear you. But it actually means that we need to go to the nations. And we go to the nations that are far away and we go to the nations that are close to us. Um, and so we want to prepare our hearts. And one of the ways in which we prepare our hearts is to, is to make sure that our, our, our attitudes are in the right place. Right? So that when Jesus comes, of course, when Jesus comes, he doesn't just come as a friend who comes to care with us. And of course, he wants to be our best friend. And he doesn't just come as a brother. The Bible says he is our brother. He's the firstborn amongst many brothers. But when he comes, he comes as Lord. Amen. He comes as Lord and he comes to bring his will and he comes to bring his kingdom. And then when his will and his kingdom enters into our lives, very often there's a clash between worlds and kingdoms. There's a clash between my will and my kingdom and God's will and God's kingdom. And the more we walk with Jesus, the more we submit to God's word, the more we submit to his spirit, that clash becomes smaller and smaller so that God's will becomes my will. And it's more seamless and it's less of a battle and I can be led by the spirit of God. But we know that there's also not just a clash very often between my will, which the Bible calls the flesh, the old man, die, die, die old man, wat so sikkel om dood te gaan, wat vir amal vertel wat hy dink, en amal een stikkie van sy opinie wil gee, that, that old guy that sometimes wants to go back to old ways of doing things, that guy needs to die, needs to submit to, to Jesus. Um, but we also know that around us, this, this world in which we live doesn't always line up with the will of Jesus. 
we open up the district mail, we open up the report, you will read a lot of stuff there that we will definitely say, hey, that isn't God's will. That isn't God's kingdom. Right? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we position ourselves so that we are not in conflict with God's kingdom, but where we are ambassadors of God's kingdom. So that God's kingdom can manifest through us. And so if somebody meets me at the mall or they play tennis with me and they listen to what I say when I make a double fault, they will see something of, of Jesus. By the way, I had, I had a lack of game of tennis on Friday. So much fun played with my younger brother. It was awesome. I beat him. Hallelujah. Yes, I did. Flesh felt good. But now the flesh is suffering. I injured my knee in the process, all right? So, so, so that's why I'm sitting. <laughs> um, so I'll praise God. So I'm going to take us to John 13, verse, verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses for us. Because in this chapter, we see a beautiful and a powerful demonstration of God's kingdom. Um, and when we think of God's kingdom and when we think of God, let your will be done, let your kingdom come. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of God's kingdom coming, and especially God's kingdom coming in power. And I know there will be many things we can think of. Uh, because we look at Jesus in the New Testament, we see how he went about healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. We, we, we see how he, he, he would cast demons out of people at one stage, thousands of them into, into a bunch of pigs, raising up people from the dead. So, so there's a lot of things which Jesus did that demonstrated the kingdom of God. But there's actually something very powerful as well that Jesus demonstrated to us and that he wants us to follow. And the way or the reason why Jesus gives us things to observe and things to remember, like for instance, we have birthday parties, or birthday celebrations. Why? Because it communicates a value. It communicates that I haven't forgotten about you. It communicates that I value you. You are precious to me. Uh, same with anniversaries and things like that, because it's not so much about the event, but it is about what it communicates. So that's why something like Easter, Easter weekend that we will celebrate, is important because it reminds us of what Jesus has come to do for us. So I want to encourage you to not just look at Easter weekend as a like a long weekend, praise God for long weekends, um, and a time to just spend with the family and go for nice hikes and swimming in the mountain or whatever it is that you do on Easter weekend, but to really slow down a little bit over these next few weeks. We've got two weeks left before we get to Easter. And to think about Jesus' as life. You know, it's fascinating that the Gospels dedicate about a third of the whole Gospel narrative in Mark, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. About a third of that is spent on the last seven days of Jesus' life. Only two Gospels mention Jesus' birth, and most of them, it's just a couple of pages on his resurrection. But a, whole, a third of it is dedicated to the last few days of Jesus' life. Now, the last few days of Jesus' life actually took place in the first month of the Jewish calendar month of Nisan, okay? So, around about the 14th or the 15th or so of Nisan, which would be, um, it, it varies from a year to year, March, April. So, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about for Jesus to sit down at the beginning of his new year. Jesus had a new year's resolution, and his new year resolution was that he was going to die for us. I don't know what your new year's resolution was, <laughs> Whether it included dying, <laughs> hopefully it didn't. Here you are, alive. But hopefully it included dying to the flesh. <laughs> hopefully it included denying something that I genuinely just want so that Christ can actually be glorified through me. And I was thinking about my own, own New Year's resolutions, and I realized how easy it is to have my New Year's resolutions be shaped by the world around me. And it's always about being faster, being stronger, being healthier, being more successful, being more effective, procrastinating less, and all of those wonderful things which are awesome and, and great. But I believe that God is actually wanting to hold before us, as a church and as His people, a important value which at one stage we as Shofar actually really celebrated and we really added as part of our culture. But I must be honest, we, we slip away from that a little bit. Okay, And I, I'm trusting God that we'll be able to bring that back and we will be able to be consistent in it, and we will be able to demonstrate what Jesus wants us to demonstrate through that. So having said all of that, let me read this. I'm going to read the whole passage for us and then dig into a couple of verses. So John 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, 
When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, it's not Simon Peter, but another Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will. No, after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? Clearly they didn't. <laughs> So it explains to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It's a very powerful verse, isn't it? Verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, the church has received many what we call sacraments from the Lord to observe. Um, one of them is communion. And please, the staff and people must remind me of the communion at the end. The other one is baptism. We celebrate a baptism. The washing of feet really is one of those powerful, unequivocal ones that Jesus also gave us. And Jesus says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I've read a few commentaries, and it is amazing how we try to sort of rationalize why we're not doing this. And obviously, there's a heart behind it. The heart behind this, I believe, is not so much to get caught up in the physical act of washing feet only. But I do think that it is probably not true to Scripture not to say that washing each other's feet need to include somewhere down the line some sort of physical manifestation. That Jesus gives us an example. And he says, for I've given you this example that you should do as I've done to you. How many of you, well, you don't have to put up your hand, but how many of you are comfortable with washing people's feet. Maybe a question attached to that is, how many of you are comfortable having your feet washed by others? Uh, I go to a place here around the corner called Just Men, where I cut my hair. But I'm honest, I'm not there for the hair cut so much as the hair or head massage afterwards. Yes, it's like, and I get for both of you Owens that do not glad me feel in there, and you're like, don't touch my head. With some of the Owens that I get them out. Oh, but it's lacquer. Go there and your head gets massaged and it just. But all of us are different. And some of us, we like physical touch. Others of us, we don't like it. And the reality is here that there's something about this picture that Jesus wants to leave with his church. And like with the disciples for us, wants to challenge what we think it means to serve someone else. And for Jesus coming into the lives of his disciples and doing this, and I want to read for us verse 1 again. It says, before the feast of the Passover, so it was the Thursday, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, and having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I, and I want you to just keep in mind this picture, right? So it's Passover. Passover was the feast that the, the Jewish men, they went to once a year, and they celebrated freedom from Egypt. And so in Jerusalem at that stage, there would be a, a, a couple of hundred thousand of men. 
biblical scholars say anything, maybe 300 to 500,000 men in Jerusalem extra, right, coming from all over Judea and the rest of Israel and other places, outskirts of the Roman Empire, coming to Jerusalem. Now, that's a lot of feet, okay? And the guys didn't walk with fancy shoes. They had sandals on. Most of them would come walking there. Quite a few of them came there on, on donkeys. They would have camels. They would have hundreds of thousands of sheep walking through Jerusalem because of the Passover feast that they had to be uh, um, sacrificed. So if you can imagine a dirty space in a dirty place, Jerusalem would be a dirty place like that. Right? So these guys have walked through this, and they come into this, into this space, and they're sitting there with, with dirty feet. Right? This house is a house that Jesus had previously had asked someone to make his house available so they could come and they can have the meal there. And Jesus having this feast, knowing that this would be the last meal he would have on earth. Knowing that very soon he would come up against the might of the Roman Empire and the might of the Pharisaical religious system. So all of these things are happening, right? So there's political turmoil. There's political oppression, a lot of violence, politically speaking. There's religious intolerance towards Jesus. Like Mike rightfully said, the Pharisees hated him. He had previously just raised Lazarus from the dead, and that's when they actually plotted to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. You can go and read the story. It actually says the Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus as well. Jesus raises him from the dead, and they're like, now you're going to die again, man. How dare you be alive? <laughs> so they hated what Jesus did. Then Jesus goes into the temple, and he casts out a lot of people who were selling stuff in the temple. So he's public enemy number one. Okay, that's pressure, knowing that there's probably in our in our language, there's a, um, a death warrant out for you. Okay, there's some gangsters out to get you if you were to live in some of our neighborhoods. So that's where Jesus is. At the same time, in this group of friends that he's been walking with for three years, these guys are having secret conversations around who is the most important. One day when we get to heaven, who's going to sit next to Jesus? They're having arguments amongst themselves about Vis die dikdom. Wie is die grootste, beste ou, daar tussen hulle allemaal. That's the kind of conversations they're having with Jesus after he has walked with them for three years. Now, I don't know about you, but if I knew that my friends, that I've discipled, and I've poured my life, if I knew that you guys are sitting here, and you're having arguments with each other about who's the best and the most important, yes, guys, that would be sad. That would really break my heart. If I were to be in a space and I would know that the government is going to come down on us. I would be maybe a little bit, if I would have knew that t- tomorrow they're going to shut us down, I would probably not be so lekker rustig sitting here on this chair, <laughs> just chilling. But that's what happened. Furthermore, within that very same meeting, there's one guy who's plotting to betray Jesus. One of his very best friends is scheming and conniving, and he has already sold himself and he sold Jesus out to the Pharisees. For 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus has all of that pressure. This world is filled with pressure. Amen? It's, you're probably not going to be anywhere where there's no pressure. And sometimes we feel that the best thing I can do is to escape this pressure and get to a space where there's less pressure, and then I'm going to be amazing. But that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is that in spite of external pressure, relational pressure, spiritual pressure, there is a way in which we can live where we are led by the Spirit of God and not by our circumstances. And Jesus demonstrates this to us so powerfully. And why could he do that? He could do that because the Bible says he knew that his hour had come. In other words, he knew his purpose. He knew that his purpose was to glorify God the Father. He knew that he was an actual fact. He was born to die. He knew his purpose. I've discovered that one of the greatest causes of stress for me and uncertainty for me is if I do not know my purpose. If I do not know why God has placed me here on the face of this earth, then I can be rattled by circumstances. If I don't know what God is busy doing, that's why last week Sunday's sermon was so powerful, guys. Get it if you missed it. If I don't know that the potter is busy shaping me and molding me so that I can become a little bit more like Christ, I can start freaking out. I can start panicking. But Jesus knew that his purpose was to lay down his life for us. And then it says, 
in the second part of that verse, that he loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. And I looked at them and I like, thank you, God, that your love is not dependent upon the object of your love. Your love is not dependent upon how qualified are those that you are loving. Because if it was, then he would have not sat there with his disciples. He would have given them a tongue lashing. He would have just been like telling them, guys, come on, man, you've got to shape up. <laughs> I've been with you for three years. Get a grip. <laughs> but see, he loved them and he loved them to the end. It's important for you. It's important for me to know this in 2024 and to know this in the times and the days that we are going into because saints, times are not going to get easier. We pray for a good election. We pray for a good government. We pray for unity amongst the churches. We pray that the poverty of cycle and destruction will be broken in our nation. We pray for revival and for transformation to come. But the reality is the Bible also says that things will get progressively worse. That we will always have the kingdom of God advancing, and then we will have things around us falling apart. This world isn't built upon evolution. It's built upon things decaying, getting worse. And we cannot hold on to a gospel that makes us believe that if I follow Jesus, things will just be getting better and better all the time. The gospel empowers us to live not because of our circumstances, but to live because of Christ inside of us. And the reason why we can live that is because he loves us. It says there that he loved his own. God loves the whole world. But the reality is that he loves his own in a very specific way. Those that he has called to be his and who have surrendered to him. That's why John 15 verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. How does God love you? Does he love you the way your dad loved you? Does he love you the way that your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse does? If they love you at the best of their abilities, that is a fraction of how God loves you. We listen to these love songs all the time. Well, all the time. So. Sometimes when I drive to school, I have to listen to KFM with my, with my girls. There's a lot of, lot, of, lot of songs on there that we sometimes have to stop and say, let's just listen to the lyrics, okay? And Katie tells me often, Dad, it's so amazing. They've got these funky beats, the very depressed songs. <laughs> and the beat is always amazing. But if you listen to the lyrics, if somebody's broken up with somebody again, and I can't live without you, and my life is falling apart, and all of those things. But sometimes the, the lyrics would be, I've loved you for a thousand years and I will love you for a thousand more. It's actually lyrics of one song. But nonsense. Nobody loves like that, humanly speaking. We can try, but the only person that loves that way and more unconditionally is God. And he doesn't love because he does love. He loves because he is love. Like and the Bible says that he loved his own. And so I want us to remember we are his own. We belong to him. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. You are not your culture. You are not your family background. You are not your addictions. You are not your fears. You're not your sin. You're not your shame. You're not your bank balance. You're not the car you drive or don't drive or the house you live in or the spouse that you are married to. You are not your own. You are God's. <laughs> Sealed with the blood of Jesus and given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. So how does that make you feel? When you think, thank you, <laughs> yes. You think about it. And here's the beauty of Easter, and I want to encourage us to slow down and to think about it. That you are his own. And of all of the stuff that Jesus had to do that week, taking the sin of the whole world upon his shoulders is such a heavy weight to carry. The Bible still says that he loved his own. He loved them to the very end. He will love you to the very end. He will love you to the very end. There's not one moment in the whole line that Uncle Chris spoke to us about a while ago that you have this line where you're born and the dot where you die, that in between. There's not one spot, there's not one little blip in that whole line where you are not loved by God. Not one. He loves you as his very own. Because Jesus knows that, Jesus knew his purpose, and Jesus acted out of love. And, and, that's, and that's, I believe, all of us. Our desire is, as a church family, is to love God and to love each other. But I have 
I have to be honest that very often in spite of my best intentions to love my family, love my wife, love my kids, love the church, I don't always act loving. I sometimes do, and I hope most of the time I do, but I sometimes don't. And I very often don't because I just haven't slept well, slept enough. And then I say things that I, I wish I didn't say. Or sometimes, of course, I've allowed things to crop up on the inside and then eventually they spill over. So I'm going to put up my hand to be the first person to say, I can grow in my capacity to love. I can grow not so much in what I feel in love, but the way that I act in love. Because isn't that the reality of this gospel message? And the reality of life really is this. It's not so much only about what you feel, but it is about what you do with what you feel. And so Jesus demonstrates to us that loving his own, what, what does that mean? And for him, it was something practical and it was something physical. And that is why the washing of feet is something so offensive and so uncomfortable and I believe yet so liberating as well. Because it is a way to demonstrate what I feel inside. So it says, supper being ended. And so John just sneaks us in there. So they're having this meal. It's a lot of pressure. Okay, they're standing together as a, as a group. Jesus told them that he's going to die in Jerusalem. They didn't want to believe him. It's a lot of pressure, right? And from the outside, pressure from the inside. The devil has found an avenue into, into Judas's heart. And in other places, uh, Jesus or the Bible describes us that Judas was the guy that was in charge of the treasury. I had the money. He, he, he collected the offering that people brought. And every so often, he would dip his hand in the offering bag and he would take a little bit of money for himself. He stole from the offering. He was also the guy that got very worked up when the, the woman came and anointed Jesus' feet with very expensive perfume. And he was like, this perfume should have been used for the poor. Actually, so there's a little bit of a hypocrisy going on there. So there was a greed inside of his heart. And the devil uses that to get into his heart and he betrays Jesus, and, 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 and verse 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and he was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. But there's something that happens here that I believe is, is very significant. It says, Jesus knows that he has all authority, all power, he has all the command of the angels of heaven at his disposal. Demons obey him. Death obeys him. You are not going to find someone more powerful than Christ. What does he choose to do with that power? What does he choose to do with that influence? What would I do? What would you do with that kind of power? If God were to answer all of your prayers, give you everything that you want, everything that you need, what would you do with that? And Jesus, knowing that God had given him everything. By the way, it's our inheritance as well. Read John 1 verse 11. It says, he came. Sorry. Um, Louis, can you, can you take us to 1 John 5 verse 4? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so for us as well, there's something that God places inside of us, that same power of overcoming that Jesus had, that he wants us to know that we are born of God and therefore he gives us the opportunity to live lives of overcoming. It gives us the opportunity to live a life that doesn't have to be known by the cycles of despair and addiction and brokenness for all of our lives. Jesus, the gospel comes and empowers us, lifts us up out of the miry clay, takes a drunkard and turns him, turns him into a father who can love his children, takes a prostitute and turns her into a mother that can love and cherish her kids. That's the power of the gospel. Takes a murderer in the Old Testament and makes him a leader of a nation. That's the gospel that does that. Takes the persecutor of the church and turns him into the greatest evangelist. That's the power of the gospel, the spirit of overcoming inside of us. Now, your greatest weakness, your greatest sin in the power of God can be used by God to live a life of glory and victory. That's the power that God gives us. It's accessible and it is available to all of us. 
But at the same time, I believe that, that God is wanting to invite us into the space to say, and I'm, and I'm giving you this message as we stand on the threshold of the walls being built of our new, our new venue this coming week. And we're moving towards trusting God that by September, we'll be able to move into a new venue. And it's going to change things for us a little bit. Right? We've, we've got an intimate space here. We've got a space where we know each other. We have a space where we can be a family. We're going to be now growing to a space where we're going to be 250 people in one venue. Right? And then evening service as well. And so we're going to grow in number. And it's so exciting because God wants us to share this message of the gospel. He wants to share the love that he's given us with those around us. He wants the youth to continue to grow, the kids to continue to grow. Why? Because lives are at stake. Families are at stake. But at the same time, I do believe that it's not so much what we do only, but how we do it. It really is so important. And so Jesus, with all of the power, think influence. Think your dreams coming true. Jesus rises from supper, lays aside his garments, takes a towel, and he girds himself. Okay, he does, he does something. He becomes proactive. There's a love that refuses to succumb to the pressure of tradition, to the pressure of family background, to the pressure of ethnicity, to the pressure of my language, to the pressure of my experiences, to the pressure of my habits. There's something more powerful inside of you than your habits. Good ones and bad ones. It's called the spirit of resurrection. It lives inside of you. I love 1 Corinthians 13 says it overcomes all things. We are not victims. If Jesus were a victim, he would have sat back and he would have said, stuff you guys. You're going to betray me, man. You're going to run away from me in a couple of hours and I have to go and face Pilate all by myself. No. He rises from supper. He becomes proactive. And he says, the love that I feel for you, I'm going to act on it. It might be time for some of us to rise from supper, to rise from a place just of comfort, a place maybe where you have been incapacitated maybe or intimidated maybe or felt overwhelmed a little bit. Maybe had emotions inside of you and you, you always wanted to tell your mom how much you love her. You always wanted to tell your dad that you forgive them. We always wanted to reach out again to that girlfriend with whom you broke up and just say, I'm sorry, please forgive me for what I did to you. But it's time to rise from supper. It's time to rise from the table. It's time to act on what is inside of your heart. The Holy Spirit that was with Jesus and enabled him not just to feel love, but to do love is the same Holy Spirit that's with us. Jesus had to do something there as well. He had to take off his, his garments. Now, later on in the Gospels, we read that the Roman soldiers refused to tear his garments like they would normally do because he was so precious. They were rolling dice to see who will win so they can get the garment. It's very expensive. And they look, that garment identified Jesus. It's sort of his, his status as a rabbi was attached to that garment. And Jesus, for a moment, he takes that off. Sometimes even the good things in our lives can prevent us from being obedient to God in the moment. The good things I've experienced, the good things my family had given me, the good things I've been taught can sometimes, not always, but sometimes limit me for what I need to do in the moment. And so saints, family of God, I want to say it again. We are children of God, not of tradition, not of culture, not through the spirit of this age in which we live that wants to say, I will judge you the way that you look on the outside. But now God is like, there's more. Some of you sitting in this room, you are so much more than the clothes you wear. You are so much more than the outside identities that people have placed on you. You are so much more than your CV. You are so much more than your work status right now. Something inside of you that is godly. So I believe that God is holding before us a renewed invitation. Church, I want you to overcome. Church, I want you to be blessed. Church, I want you to cast out the demons. Church, I want you to heal the sick. Church, I want you to preach the gospel to those who don't know me yet. Church, I want you to see relationships restored. But church, I want you to do all of that in the spirit of a servant. It's not about our church. It's not about our ministry. It's not about our anointing. It's not about how I look. It is about the spirit of Christ that says that I want to do the will of the Father. And if for Jesus it meant 
putting off some things and putting on something new. The towel was, was the way that the lowest of the servants were dressed. The, the youngest, the lowest of the servants were dressed with a towel. Jesus becomes the lowest. He's king of kings, king of glory. Most amazing man that ever lived. He comes, gets down on his knees, and he washes dirty feet. That he walked through the dung of a dirty towel. He washes them. He said, I know some of you will betray me. I know almost all of you will run away from me. But I still love you. I still love you. And he washes them. And old Peter, Peter can't handle it. <laughs> Peter begins to just, like, Lord, are you washing my feet? And for some of us, it's a challenge to be loved. Some of us, it's a challenge to think that the king of the universe would just want you to become a little bit quiet over these next two weeks. Stop doing stuff for him. Stop running after new stuff. Stop making new plans to get out of this and get out of that. And just sit for a few moments and allow him to wash your feet. Allow him to speak his word over you. Allow him to tell you how much he loves you. How valuable you are to him. How priceless you are to him. We watched a beautiful, challenging movie last night called Priceless. It's about these two girls that get trafficked into the States from Mexico. And the guy that trafficked them into the States, he, and the Lord grips his heart and changes his heart. And so he goes back and he tries to, he tries to buy them back again. And so he goes onto the sites and he starts looking for those pictures of the girls. And he gets to the right pump eventually and he phones and he, and he asks for the price and they give him a price and he says, no, 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 I'm going to pay, my, I wanna, I'm gonna pay $1,000. It's per hour that you pay. And the guy says, you're crazy. She isn't worth that much. And he says, no, to me, she's priceless. Even $1,000 is not enough for price tag. Some of us, we carry price tags around here on the inside. That people have placed on us. And I believe God is wanting to say to you, the price tag that hangs over your life is bought with the blood of Jesus. That's why we celebrate Easter. The blood that was shed for you is the blood that says you are God's. You belong to him. So old saying says, can you stand to be blessed? Can you can you?" Can you be still enough for God for a couple of moments to just tell you how much he loves you? So maybe for some of you, you need to just go to the Bible and, and just get all the verses that speak of how much God loves you. Record it on your phone and just speak it over yourself over and over again. Sit in God's presence. Allow him. Put up your hand and ask somebody to pray for you. Receive again. Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. Jesus, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And Peter Simon says to the Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my hand. I love this about Peter. He's like when he realizes that God really wants to do this for him, and it, it messed with his religious mind. He just the Messiah, the man that we expect right now is tomorrow going to overthrow the Roman Empire. This one becomes a servant, and he's serving me. This doesn't make sense. Some of us need to give up boxes to the Lord and say, God, you can use whomever you want to use to bless me. I don't know if you have a person in your life, but it's a little bit easier to find certain people to receive from others. Sometimes. And I believe for some of us, God, we want to bless you out of avenues that you don't expect it to. And you've actually closed the door because you're not looking in the direction. Lord, I want to say to some of us in this room, come on, just give me permission to bless you however I want to bless you. Amen? In that room, there were two spirits operating, and I'm going to give an invitation for us to respond. There was a spirit that was in Judas. There was a spirit of discontent and, and greed that basically says that I will never be satisfied unless I'm receiving, right? In, in modern terms, we talk about a narcissistic spirit. It's a spirit that is focused on myself. It's a terrible prison in which to live. 
where you are enslaved by your own needs. And God wants to set us free from that. And the way we get delivered from that is by serving others. It's to, to break that, that spirit of greed over us that, that hangs over this place that says more, more, bigger, better all the time. You know, it pushes us spiritually as well so that we can never come to rest. We can never just be in front of God. And I believe the Lord is wanting to set us free from that. The spirit of pride that goes along with that is, is also one that never rests. But it rests on the other. The other one is always, give me, give me, give me, give me. I'm never satisfied. I'm never satisfied. The other spirit is, I've got to work, 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 work. I'm never satisfied unless I'm giving. The spirit that Jesus had was a spirit of surrender. I'm just here to do the will of the Father. Even if that will cost me my ego, cost me my comfort, if the will of the Father wants to lead me into freedom, challenges me, I want to go with that. So I want to ask you guys as, as we stand this, this morning, that you will commit, please, please stand. Let's commit our week to the Lord.